Hey guys, I'm Sumner and this is Sumner on and today we're going to start talking with psychopharmacology. Now before we start we need to know a few key words. Exogenous, endogenous, side of action. Exogenous means it comes from without, so outside of the body, not like without, like I don't have it, but without from out of the body. Endogenous, within, so it comes from within the body. Sites of action, that's the place where drugs work. Now there's something else that we also need to know about this. We also need to know the word uh, pharmacokinetics. And that's just how a drug enters the body, where it acts, how it's metabolized, and where it's excreted. So the movement of the drug throughout the body. There's several different types of injection type. We have intravenous, interperitoneal, intermuscular, and subcutaneous. And the differences between them is that intravenous is typically the fastest, just goes right into the vein. Intraperitoneal is around your peritoneal cavity, so by the stomach and whatnot. Uh, subcutaneous is just under the skin, and intramuscular is into a large muscle, and that one's fairly slow for absorption of the drug. Now we're not just limited to needles when it comes to administering drugs. So you know there are different types of administration. For example, there's oral, sublinguals under the tongue, which is very, very hard in animals. There's rectal, there's inhalation, then there's insufflation, which is the fancy word for sniffing, and that's different because drugs can go right up through the nose and the mucous membrane a lot faster. Then there's intrarectal, which I don't know if I mentioned already, but if I didn't, I'm just mentioning again, it's great for things that upset the stomach because it's right where it needs to be. There's topical, so on your skin, a lot of steroid stuff, especially you watch those communicals for like, uh, com not communicals, commercials for things like low T, which uh, you should never be using that. Don't touch it, don't get it on your skin. That's why I say wash it off, keep it away from children and whatnot, because if you touch it, it can go through your skin because it's lipid and lipid soluble. So I ran out of breath, so I edited me breathing because it took me a very deep breath. We also have uh, intracerebral, so intracerebral is a direct injection into a part of the brain, so you can see a direct effect of the drug. And then there's intracerebral ventricular, which is into the ventricles. And there I go breathing again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have to breathe. And the intracerebral ventricle, ventricular, ventricular, blah, blah, blah. the intracerebral ventricular, um, that's into the ventric ventricles. Remember when we talked about the ventricles? You know, sometimes there gets infection, so it circulates throughout the ventricles. It's absorbed by most of the brain tissue that's kind of touching the ventricles, and it can help fight infections that way. Now, if you noticed when we were talking about this, we only really mentioned like two techniques that go like right into the brain. Everything else starts outside of the brain. So how do drugs go from body anywhere down in the, you know, I'm not even gonna show that, down in the other end, because I'm not wearing pants. Just kidding, I am wearing pants. You can prove it, but they're sweatpants. Um, so the, the, the um, what was I saying? I was saying, how do drugs get from the body to the brain? And that, is a, is a good question. Remember when we were talking about cells and nervous system, we had glia, we had astroglia, they help form part of the blood-brain barrier, where there's not the blood-brain barrier, it's just the capillary wall itself is part of the blood-brain barrier. So how do drugs get in? Because the blood-brain barrier is very, very specific for water-soluble things. It doesn't like them. So lipids get in pretty easily, which is great. And other things are very, very hard, and there's a lot of medical research, especially enough nanotechnology, trying to figure out how we can get drugs to go through the brain, because cutting people's heads open and putting holes in them and injecting stuff, that's just not great way of administering things. But, 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 there is always a lot of buts, especially when you do intrarectal administration. Just think about that for a moment. So why do we care about how drugs get to the brain? Well, let's just take an example. Heroin, morphine. Uh, they're pretty much the same, especially at their side of action, especially in effectiveness. The difference is, is how they get there. Mm, not morphine, heroin. Heroin is far more lipid soluble. And what that means is because it's more lipid soluble, it can more quickly go through the blood brain barrier and get to the brain. The sooner it gets to the brain, the sooner it can cause effects, the sooner it causes effects, the sooner you feel the rush, the more you feel the rush, the larger the rush is uh, qualitatively. So if you ask someone, how big is the rush from uh, heroin? They'll be like, pretty darn skippy, because it gets there so much faster than morphine does. Even if you inject it from the same place, just takes longer. So drugs, uh, how do we know how they're effective? Well, the first thing we do is you form a dose response curve, and that's just basically uh, in milligrams per kilograms. So milligram drug per kilogram body of weight of person against the effect that you want to see, or the effect of the drug in general. 
And so now, great, you have a, a, a dose response curve, and how do you know how much to use? Well, or how much is safe to use? The way we do that is we administer drugs to animals, and we look for two things. One, how much drug causes 50% of the animals to experience the desired effect that we want to see. Awkward pause and mid-thought, because I can. The second is that we want to see how much how, how much drug if we if we give an animal you know drugs how much um, causes 50% of them to experience toxic effects so effects we don't want to see and then we take a ratio of the two of safe to not safe and this ratio is called the therapeutic index the higher the index so the larger this ratio between safe and not safe the less careful I mean you should always be careful less careful you have to be the smaller it is, the more careful because the if you hit just a little bit off, then it's more likely to elicit a toxic effect. And remember, this is only 50% of the animals, so if someone just happened to be an outlier and it affects them really, really easily, then a little bit off on something with a small therapeutic index might, you know, cause very toxic effects. Now, why do drugs have different effectiveness? Uh, that can be for a lot of reasons. I think I've mentioned it in a previous video, but if I haven't, I'll just give a few examples. It could be where they uh, bind, you know, different drugs, different different sites of action. It could also just be the affinity for that drug to a binding site. One drug might be like, I like this receptor, and I'm going to hug it for the rest of my short life before I get metabolized. And it, that might uh, help because, you know, there's, you're only injecting, like, you know, micrograms of a drug, and your body is a lot bigger than micrograms. It's measured in kilograms. So, you know, just the, just getting that stuff, you know, from the body into the brain and having that stuff bind to the right spots of action, it requires a lot of drug, and so the higher the affinity means the less drug you need for some of those little, mo some of the very few molecules to reach the site that they are supposed to reach, and then they'll bind to that, because they might also bind to other things. Uh, so that's just a few examples of how drug effectiveness can vary. Great, so now what happens when you repeatedly use a drug? So there's tolerance, which is when the effects of the drug diminish over time. There is sensitization, where the effects of the drug increase over time. And then there's withdrawal, and that's the stuff that you uh, experience or feel. That's what I was trying to say first. Um, experience when you stop using the drug after you've had tolerance occur. Withdrawal works. I'll just give like a brief synopsis in the sense that you uh, your body compensates for the loss or the missing drug that you are normally taking and it does that in several different ways maybe it decreases affinity of the drug to the receptors maybe it makes the receptors less effective at activating specific effects i've talked about this more in some of the brain disorder ones especially on addiction and tolerance so if you're really that interested in it you can skip ahead if not you can wait of course, no discussion about pharmacology or an administering drugs is ever complete without talking about the placebo effect. So for those of you who don't know what a placebo effect effect is, a placebo effect is um, a, a placebo is something that you administer that has no specific or really significant effects, but if someone thinks it does, it might cause them. Now, we don't have to worry about this with animals, because if you administer a placebo or a drug, they don't really care what you're doing. They care more of the fact that you're just picking them up, you're exposing them in a way that's typically not exposed, you're injecting them with something, and they didn't really, you know, sign a consent waiver. And so with uh, placebos, have a lot of benefit there, because in animal trials, we can see how the effects of just, you know, handling them is maybe, maybe that, maybe just the experience, the stressful experience of, you know, administering drugs to them affects uh, some studies and that's actually the uh one of the, the one of the fathers of um that's uh, actually how one of the fathers of stress research i think like hans silky s-c-l-y-e don't don't quote me on that uh start, he got started he actually injected stuff in the ovaries into uh into one rat and then placebo into the other and he wanted to see the effects of it but both groups i got more ulcers because of the stress from injecting, just the experience of being injected, whether it was a placebo or not. Okay, for now for how or what drugs are actually doing at the site of action, and so to begin our discussion, most of the drugs that affect for psychopharmacology, you know, behavior or neuro nervous system, affect the synaptic transmission. I think this is one of, one of either one either one of two ways, and the first is they can 
agonize something or they can antagonize something. Agonists um, promote whatever that behavior or you know mechanism would have been and antagonists block it. Agonists have a lot of different ways that they can work. They could be precursors to the neurotransmitters, they could promote neurotransmitter release, they could also just stimulate the postsynaptic receptors that the neurotransmitter would have bounded to if it got there. They can also block uh, with the, po the autoreceptors, so that's things, remember we talked about, they, they will self-inhibit themselves, self-regulate self -regulate themselves. They can block enzymes that would degrade a neurotransmitter, things of that nature. And then there are antagonists, and they prevent the uh, precursors and synthesis of neurotransmitters, the storage of neurotransmitters, the release of neurotransmitters, the postsynaptic receptors that the neurotransmitters would have worked on, and they then promote the autoreceptors, which self-regulate the neurotransmitter release. Now, like leptons, I don't know how much leptons. I don't know how much you know about particle physics, but uh, they come in different flavors. So we have direct agonists and antagonists, which bind exactly to the same spot that whatever they are mimicking would have bound to. Then there are indirect antagonists. An indirect antagonist bind to an allosteric site of the receptor, for example. So you, like if this is your receptor and uh, the space in between my thumb is where the neurotransmitter would go, then they might bind over here, you know, like in the space in between my pinky. And if they do so, that might cause my thumb to close and now the neurotransmitter can't bind. Or it might uh, if this is a channel, you know, which could open up, you know, so open, close, oh, or, you know, this is a channel and it can open and close, open and close. If binding here might cause the channel to stay closed, even if a neurotransmitter were to bind, things like that. So some complexity, uh, we have autoreceptors, right? So autoreceptors, they self-regulate. If you have lots of neurotransmitters in the synapse and the autoreceptor is going to say, whoa, we have enough. So if you have an agonist to an autoreceptor, you're going to decrease the neurotransmitter is released. And similar, if you block or antagonize an autoreceptor, you will increase the amount of neurotransmitter release. Now, remember from like one of the earlier videos, uh, we also had exoaxonic uh, uh, synapses. So the, the, the terminal of one would then hit and touch upon the axon of the other and have presynaptic facilitation or inhibition. Now, these receptors, the receptors in these synapses, are called heteroreceptors. Auto means self, hetero means other, it's another neuron causing, causing this. And depending on whether or not this, the heteroreceptor in general causes facilitation or inhibition, and depending or not your drug is facilitating or inhibiting that, you can then either get facilitation or, inhibitation or inhibition of neurotransmitters. So this is the background and overview of psychopharmacology. Next time we're actually gonna get into neurotransmitters and if Depending on how long that video gets into, maybe neuromodulators, which will be very, very brief as well. And uh, so post a comment uh, about your favorite drug. If you have one, maybe it's Special K. You eat it every morning for breakfast. I mean, uh, who am I to judge? Your, your favorite drug, uh, over the counter or not. Um, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.